Good morning friends. So, as we come to the end of the course, I thought it appropriate to um, run through a very important uh, critical theory and a critical concept that is postmodernism. Um, this is a, a much discussed term. We, I am talking about postmodern cinema primarily today because um, as you would remember that I started this course with discussing modernism. We also talked a, a great deal about uh, film theory and criticism. So, if we have been talking about modernism, semiotics, um, various critical concepts, we have also talked about masculinity in relationship to uh, Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull. So, it is important that while we are winding up the course, at least we get familiar with one key theory of uh, uh, the late 60s, 70s and 80s uh, that is postmodernism. The root term modernism, but that we have already discussed while postmodernism as the prefix post uh, very clearly suggests that postmodernism uh, describes something that comes after modernism. As you know, modernism was a response to the ordered, stable and uh, essentially meaningful world view of the 19th century, the world view which could not comprehend the anarchy of the 20th century. So, that was what modernism was all about. Postmodern is something that comes after modernism. Uh, some of the films that are mentioned here, these are not all, but these are primarily some of the films that uh, fall very neatly under the category of postmodernist cinema. But first, let us talk about uh, the key theorists that uh, um, whose theories we will be falling over back on Frederick Jameson, Linda Hutchin and Ahab Hassan whose the dismemberment of Orpheus is a key text of postmodernism. We will uh, be referring to very key postmodernist texts. Um, primarily, I will be talking about uh, uh, John Woo's face off and also uh, Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction, but it would be instructive to know that there are other very important texts that have been discussed through the lens of postmodernist theory, Inception, Memento, Run, Lola, Run by Tom Tweaker. We will also talk about how postmodernism is um, represented through films about media. Okay, so, in that category, we have films such as Network, The Truman Show, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, Good Night, Good Luck. We will also talk about um, another genre that is anthology films. Anthologies, uh, anthology films are those which are um, short films like a portmanteau or an omnibus and they are put together in a complete set of films. It is a very avant-garde, this very experimental kind of filmmaking. We do not have uh, a great number of, of examples from our own cinema of anthology films, but it is a very popular genre especially for horror cinema. However, other kinds of films also use it, use it occasionally this genre and uh, we will be talking basically about a movie called Paris Athen, okay, Paris I love you. So, um, as I was talking about by the mid or late 60s, it was felt that modernism, the key concepts of modernism and its entire notion of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, having a center or um, uh, having an inherent stability and order. So, these concepts started getting questioned which led to the growth of postmodernism. Now, according to Linda Hutchin in politics of postmodernism, Postmodernism manifests itself in many fields of cultural endeavor, for example, architecture, literature, photography, art, 
film, painting, video, dance, etc. In general terms, it takes the form of self-conscious, self-contradictory, self-undermining statement. So, these are the terms that you should remember when you discuss postmodernism, self-consciousness, self-reflexivity. And when you look at the films that we have been talking about, particularly Run, Lola, Run, and um, uh, there is also a film by Michael Hank that is uh, Funny Games. Okay? So, watch these films uh, and you will understand that how self-reflexive these films are. So, that is one of the key terms related to it. Uh, now, we know that in literature uh, or particularly literature of realism, that becomes a mode of slice of life, representing slice of life and capturing the very similitude, you know, the being true to life. Postmodernism literature, postmodernist literature rather, uh, it is a case against realism. It uh, uh, rather than being monologic, it is dialogic and heteroglossic. Now, this is anti realist, and anti realist revolt is intended to function as a dissenting art that challenges the unreliability of realism. Generally, the term or the point is uh, 1968, where the uh, where the poet Stephen Spender, uh, who was very active those days, and the period was referred to by Stephen Spender as the year of the young rebels, for a variety of reasons. We have been talking about why 1968 is a very critical period socially, culturally, when we were talking about American New Wave. So you have to go back to the uh, previous lectures why 1968 is important. The student revolt of Paris. So, there were so, so many things happening in, in the year 1968 and therefore, it is important. So, Stephen Spender calls the year as the year of the young rebels and postmodernism is often considered modernism's uh, nemesis signifying a break. It is a very deliberate fracturing of the narrative. Frederick Jameson in his postmodernism or the cultural capital, sorry, the cultural logic of the late capitalism, that is the title of the book, Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism. It is a 1991 book. Um, he refers to uh, the key concepts or features of postmodernism. One, uh, one element is the erosion of the distinction between high and low culture and uh, incorporation of material from other texts. Uh, think of Pulp Fiction as a key text and uh, think how Tarantino incorporates material from other texts. Even his earlier film, The Groundbreaking Reservoir Dogs and just uh, go back uh, to the entire discussion of uh, Madonna's MTV videos um, just before the highest scene. Okay. Um, the frequent, the frequent use of uh, sourced music. So, incorporation of material and uh, being very self-conscious about it, self-reflexive about it. Postmodernism, ac again according to Jameson, uh, uh, also suggests breaking down of boundaries between different genres of writing. Now, you do not know whether this film is a love story or an action film or something else or a musical, it becomes several yeah, kinds of genres. So, we, are, we have been talking about genre theory, now we are talking about genre bending, genre blending. Postmodern artists cannot uh, invent new perspectives and new modes of expressions, instead they perform as bricolaires. Bricolaires are people who take um, material from different sources. Okay and they try to construct something of their own. So, leading to recycling previous works and previous styles, again think of Pulp Fiction and how it is leading, it is a, it is basically a, 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 a gangster genre, but and where <coughs> several previous works and styles have been recycled, genres are blended and bended. And again use of pastiche, pastiche is very important concept. In postmodernism, uh, pastiche is a kind of parody, but a parody that has lost a sense of humor. It is not the funny kind of parody that we generally understand. Yes. 
uh, in the dismemberment of Orpheus which is a 90, 1971 book by Ahab Hassan. Um, Ahab Hassan refers to the image of the classical Orpheus who is the divine singer who is torn to pieces uh, by the maenads in Hades as he looks for his wife Eurydice. But his head continues singing although his lyre is broken into 100 pieces. Now, this is a key text for understanding postmodernism, torn into several pieces, but is still some there is something that is still remains. Modernism was essentially rational as we have already talked about, but um, Unlike the modernists who created works out of pure imagination, the postmodern artist works with cultural givens trying to manipulate them in various ways such as again I will use the same terms that I have been talking about earlier, pastiche, collage, bricolage, parody and also juxtaposition. So, Hassan makes a distinction between modernism and postmodernism where he calls modernism as a uh, as an offshoot of uh, romanticism which has a form and a purpose and has design and certain kind of uh, centralized hierarchy um, and there is a finished product at the end whereas according to Ahab Hassan postmodernism is anti form it is playful uh, rather than depending on a design or carefully constructed design it depends more on chance it is anarchic uh, rather than resorting to logos or words it's, it depends on silences. Okay. It is more about uh, being a work in progress, a performance in happening rather than being a finished work. Whereas modernism believed in genres and the boundaries between genres for the postmodernism a text is always intertext, so blurring and dissolving the boundaries between texts. So, this is these are the important terms that we should understand about um, postmodernism. It is ironical, it is marked by indeterminacy. Now, coming to postmodernist cinema, postmodernist cinema again is a literary and cultural phenomenon. It is characterized by delegitimation of authority and which leads to indeterminacy and erosion of a centralized authority. Some of the key features of a postmodernist cinema and think run Lola run, Tom Tweakers run Lola run, also Buzz Lerman's Moulin Rouge, okay. think of all these films and consider the fragmented editing style the non-linear narrative, the parallel stories that are unrelated, um, total loss of centrality or uh, central hierarchical figure, fluidity of identity, intertextuality and uh, depending on allusion and pastiche and quoting from other sources, all these postmodernist works they encourage multiple readings, uh, they are told from several perspectives, multiple perspectives, they celebrate anarchy, they resist closure. Okay. So, again go to your Randola run, again uh, think about Pulp Fiction or a film like Memento and also Inception okay, and you will understand that how well these films fit into this genre. Now, we know that uh, uh, what is pastiche. Now, postmodernist fiction asks us to make distinction, but not choices between high and low art. Okay. And therefore, we have the mixing level of genres or cultures that create a kind of hybridity that challenges the traditional notions of uniformity. So, when we are talking about narrative fragmentation, think again of um, uh, a movie like Zelig, you know Woody Allen's mockumentary 
it is a it is in it is done in a, a documentary way, but it is it is still mocks the genre ok. Uh, uh, Momento uh, and Fight Club are other important works as well as Requiem for a Dream. So, these are the films that rely on narrative fragmentation. Think of Moulin Rouge where which is uh, uh, fragmented, the narrative is extremely fragmented and MTV style editing which is very self conscious and has truly global postmodernist um, look for example, the spectacle it creates and then think of the musical styles which are identifiable in the film, the European vaudeville, cabaret culture, music hall stage shows, comic opera, pop songs and the melodramas on which some serious Italian operas are based. So, this is what we understand when we talk about fragmented narratives and past dishes. If you watch Moulin Rouge, you will understand how all these features come into play. Nostalgia, now going back and uh, uh, um, looking with a certain kind of fondness for the uh, cinema or styles or genres of the earlier period. Now, this is a prevalent mode of postmodernist cinema. You have a film like Pleasant Will, Will uh, in which uh, brother and sister they go back to the period uh, of the 40s and the 50s when it was considered that uh, life was uh, more pleasant, but then soon reality starts coming out. So, nostalgia and questioning in nostalgia. You, you also have uh, David Lynch's Blue Velvet, a key example of uh, postmodernist film. Um, consider also Hairspray and Cry Baby, Edward Scissorhands and The Truman Show and various past dishes of uh, Hitchcock films that have been made of late especially by Gus Van Sant and also Brian De Palma. Postmodernist cinema also relies on fragmented and psychic delusion. So, think of all David Lynch films and we have already talked about David Cronenberg's Dead Ringers and Crash. Other good uh, examples of uh, this uh, genre would be eternal sunshine of a spotless mind being John Malkovich, Sinek Doc in New York, Coen Brothers a serious man and Martin Scorsese's Shutter Island all of which disco, um, depict a very um, deluded mind and a fragmented psyche. Now, um, resisting closure is another key element of postmodernist cinema. So, for example, again go back to Iranian cinema, ok. Um, we have been talking about Iranian cinema. If you watch Taste of Cherry by Kirastami, you will understand that uh, it resists closure. We do not know how the man is going to end up. Again, Chinese cinema, we have talked about Chinese cinema also in our, one of our earlier uh, lectures. Think of films of Wong Kar Wai, think of films of, German, of the German director Wim Wenders. Pulp Fiction of course, Inception and Memento, yes. So, all these films they resist closure, again they are self referential, they refer to the process of cinema, pop culture and uh, um, you know drawing attention to the production and process of filmmaking. So, you have one of the earliest key uh, examples such as Fellini's Eight and Half, then uh, more recently uh, Barry Levinson's Wag the Dog starring Dustin Hoffman and Robert De Niro. You have Stardust Memories of uh, uh, by Will, uh, Woody Allen and The Purple Rose of Cairo again by Woody Allen. Edward that is a Tim Burton movie and To Die For ok this movie starring Nicole Kidman in a small town. So, um, all these things neatly fit in the category of postmodernist film. Now, um, there is another concept called hyperlink cinema. Now, hyperlink uh, the term is com coined by someone called Elisa Quart and Elisa Quart uses this uh, term hyperlink cinema particularly for films which are multilinear in a metaphorical sense. For example, 
pulp fiction, you uh, also adaptation, uh, the Kaufman brothers adaptation, then sliding doors, 21 grams, Bay Bill, Suriana, City of God. So, these films are characterized by their multilinearity and therefore, they can be called hyperlink cinema. One story leads to another, that is how. Again, we will be talking about, I uh, will be referring to very briefly to anthology cinema also and the key films here are Coffee and Cigarettes by Jim Jamash, Pari Jatem, uh, made by multiple authors, multiple directors. So, you see even a film is, uh, even one film has several authors, so complete disintegration of authority. The New York I Love You, the New York stories, Tokyo stories, Toronto stories, all great examples of anthology films. And again going back to our concept of postmodernism that is breaking down of central hierarchical figure. We have been talking about Face Off, John Woo's Face Off which is a 1997 film starring uh, Nicolas Cage and John Travolta. So, again think of the idea of blurred identities in the film, one man assuming the identity of another and then also uh, slowly becoming like him. Okay. The movie is also known for its hyper real violence which is a, a typical of John Woo making a cinematic spectacle and also um, uh, how you know um, we are talking about nostalgic cinema. So, even in the opening scene we find in sepia color tone um, references to the climax of Hitchcock's Strangers on a Train. So, you look at the climax of Strangers on a Train and the opening scene of Pulp Fiction and you will find how John Woo is harking back to that cinema, to Hitchcock's cinema. Now, um, coming again, uh, coming back again to Frederick Jameson and his The Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism. Jameson see, sees the reliance on the styles of the past as an indication of the particular kind of nostalgia that is one of the defining characteristics of postmodern art. He also says that random cannibalization of all the styles of the past reduces the past to a series of spectacles, a collection of images disconnected from any genuine sense of historical process. In his uh, postmodernism and consumer society, Frederick Jameson says uh, that uh, the, he gives us a concept of psychic fragmentation or schizophrenia and an experience of the isolated, disconnected, discontinuous material signifiers which fail to link into a coherent sequence. So, this is the postmodernist condition. Now, again going back to face off, think of the past dishes it evokes, ok. Music becomes a kind of past dish. We have been talking about diegetic, non-diegetic sound. So, diegetic is within the uh, film and think when uh, um, Nicolas Cage's character is uh, seen against the backdrop of Handel's classic symphony Hallelujah, whereas the extra diegetic scene it becomes like rock, ok. The rock scene when he first arrives from the airport and uh, uh, you know um, giving us uh, of uh, establishing the character of Nicolas Cage. Again think of the shootout scene um, at one point in the film which is done to the music of Judy Garland somewhere over the rainbow from the Wizard of Oz. So, again very uh, interesting use of music and pastiche and nostalgia. We also know the story of face, uh, face Off and how um, John Woo uses the concept of doppelganger, you know every person has his other that kind of concept here, that idea here. The heroes, the two heroes, they swap identities and uh, how they assume 
not each just each other's faces, but also their behavior, behavioral patterns. So, um, soon Nicholas Cage's transformation into Archer, okay, he becomes the haunted hero and we remember Nicholas Cage from his earlier films Moonstruck and Con Air, where the, whereas Travolta he turns into Pollux and his customary fluid movements and they remind us of Grease, Saturday Night Fever, Pulp Fiction. Now, um, again um, postmodernist cinema which relies on fragmented editing styles. A key text of this would be uh, of course, face off, but also natural born killers that was that is uh, a movie by Oliver Stone a 1994 film. So, natural born killers is about serial killers on the run and it discusses or it focuses on the idea of crime and criminal psychology in a media saturated society. Some of the great films by Oliver Stone are The Hand, Salvador, Wall Street, The Doors, JFK, Nixon, U-Turn, Any Given Sunday, Alexander, World Trade Center, W, etc. So, think of uh, Oliver Stone's films and how mm, grounded the filmmaker is in the socio-cultural politics of his times. And Oliver Stone is also remembered for the Vietnam trilogy that is Platoon Born on 4th of July and Heaven and Earth. Now, in Natural Born Killers, he addresses the violent tendencies of American society and again uses MTV style quick cutting and intrusive acting. The story is about again it is like Bonnie and Clyde uh, plot. Here you have Mickey and Mallory Knox and uh, an all American couple they go on a cross country killing spree. Halfway through the film they are captured by a sadistic policeman. Jack Scagnati. The climax focuses on Mickey and Mallory's escape, which appears like a parody of uh, the standard Hollywood fare. So, um, all this is shown through tinted, saturated colors, weird camera angles, slow and fast motion camera uh, motion. Stone provides the viewers with a chaotic and fragmented feel and makes an anti-violence statement. He deals with the psychic fragmentation of the individual subject and maps a loss of temporal continuity leading to schizophrenia. Like true postmodern individuals, Mickey and Mallory have fragmented plural and discontinuous identities. The film offers a pastiche, a collage of popular genres through intercutting of images, films images from Scarface flash on the screen as Mickey and Mallory brutalize a young woman. Um, then uh, images from television, cartoons, the film's music is a mix of contemporary rock, traditional romantic products and implies that postmodernist fragmentation is centrifugal and denying the possibility of closure. So, while in uh, uh, a film like Pulp Fiction, violence is cool. Still in natural born killer, violence is not so cool, while Pulp Fiction relies on hip music and also John Woo also relies on hip music, natural born killers has a rather dark kind of a diegetic music or even extra diegetic music. Pulp Fiction relies on non-linear narrative, whereas face off and non natural born killers, they both experiment in editing. We have been talking about disruption of the centralized figures and again in Pulp Fiction as well as in um, natural born killers, the authority figures are corrupt, violent, they are desperate to be in limelight. Jack Scagnati, the cop is a deranged 
person, a deranged um, drug addict cop who cannot be trusted and the warden as played by Tommy Lee Jones, he is another psychotic character. Um, and again the question is the dark impulses that run through the American society. Media too and uh, here in uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s character we have a media figure um, and the idea is in contemporary America reality exists only in the context of media images. So, um, films about media, this is an important aspect and we have been talking here about films about media who which deal um, with how American society is represented through its media or how media looks at the society and creates identities. So, some of the characteristics about of uh, films about media are that they critique the commodification of American culture, they map the decline in the ability of Americans to distinguish between fiction and reality, they reduce everything to mere entertainment as was shown so clearly by Sidney Lumet in his network and again there is a blurring of boundaries between media and different levels of reality. Again films about media show how there is no fixed, stable and concrete reality. At this point it would be instructive to go back to Walter Benjamin's uh, essay The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, where Benjamin calls film as the most powerful agent of the work of art by modern mechanically reproduced art forms where there is no original for Benjamin films are fragmented as shots, scenes and takes and disrupt the sense of wholeness that gives traditional art much of its religious flavor. Films shatter the aura of the traditional sanctity of art and acts um, or rather act as democratization of human societies. So, films about and critiquing media are a part of cinematic culture. As early as uh, uh, during the late uh, 40s, Frank Capra's uh, Meet John Doe, it explored the nexus between politics and media. Again, George Cooker's It Should Happen to You, which is a 1954 movie, was one of the earliest films to discuss the notion of celebrity and how media hypes certain uh, people making them famous for being famous. Coming to Sidney Lumet's network in 1976, uh, again it reflects or illustrates postmodern ten, post tendency of converting reality into spectacle, where one of the characters say there is no America, there is no democracy, there is only IBM and DuPont, Dow and Union Carbide. So, films about um, media, they are very self conscious, very postmodernist way of uh, cinema and always there is one key theme or key message that media is dangerous. This was done in David Cronenberg's video drum and uh, before that in Elia Kazan's A Face in the Crowd. It has also dealt with addiction and corruption that media can be addictive as well as corrupt as was seen in Requiem for a Dream and also in Robert Redford's quiz show. In George Clooney's Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, which is a biopic of Chuck Barris. Chuck Barris was a, a well known a television personality, but he was many other things as well. He is a game show host and also an assassin for the CIA. And then there are films which deal with the black comedy, uh, the, there is a subgenre of drama that is black comedy and uh, media and black comedy as was seen in Scorsese, the king of comedy and also to die for. To die for is a Gus Van Sant movie. So, media is dangerous in a face in the crowd and video drum is addict, addictive in, in Requiem for a Dream and Quiz Show and also in Slumdog Millionaire and media people can get or become obsessive with media and media personalities 
for example, in king of comedy and to die for. In uh, the Truman Show, which is a Peter Weir film in 1998 starring Jim Carrey, through the blurring of reality and fiction, we see dehumanizing forces at work for higher rating. Here is a scene from King of Comedy. So, again if films such as Network and Requiem are a damning portrayal of television, occasionally media is also shown as a positive and corrective force. For example, you have films about uh, the McCarthy period in um, uh, as seen in Good Night and Good Luck, um, which is a film directed by George Cl uh, Clooney based on Ed Murray's show. Ed, Ed Murrow was a very respected, respectable uh, TV host who exposed Senator McCarthy's witch hunting of communists in America. Again, in Michael Mann's The Insider, which is a 1990 film, it deals with an episode in the life of Dr. Jeffrey Valent and his confrontation with the big tobacco company. So, The Insider is a great movie um, starring Al Pacino and uh, Russell Crowe and the movie has to be watched because uh, for the you know meticulous effort that uh, media men can put into a story and expose something that is really rotten. Again, in a movie like uh, Gary Ross's Pleasantville, um, uh, there, are, uh, there is a brother and sister played by Toby Maguire and his sister Reese Witherspoon. So, um, uh, they are troubled high school kids and fascinated by reruns of the 50 sitcoms. Pleasantville uh, is the name of sitcom Pleasantville because it seems to project a perfect world in which life is so much simpler than their lives in the 90s. So, soon uh, there is a, there comes a TV repairman in their lives and he gives them a magical remote control, David and his sister, they are transported to the 40s quite like back to the future. They are propelled into the television world uh, of the uh, town of Pleasantville. There they assume the roles of the son and daughter of George and Betty Parker and thus they become a part of the central family in the sitcom. This is a town where houses have picket fences and people are all white and middle class. In the black and white world, the 90s kids introduce truth, art and passion in ways that make color bloom selectively on townspeople, now who turn into three dimensional figures. Soon there is a conservative backlash. The film acknowledges the extent to which our memories of the 50s are constituted through media representation, especially on television. At another level, it foregrounds the process of representation through its symbolic use of black and white to represent the spiritual poverty of the conformist past and brilliant colors to represent the richness of the human potential that is being thwarted by this conformism. The film also blurs the distinction between reality and representation by having the central characters begin the film in the reality of the 1990s and then literally projecting them into the world of 1950s, 1950s television sitcom. Most films as I have been telling you about media thus present life in the postmodern world where we all encounter a reality that is constituted by the media and its images. Now, uh, coming to the last part of this lecture, I will quickly go through anthology films and how they are so postmodernist in character. An anthology film which is also called Omnibus Support Mentor Film is a film constituting of several different short films often tied together by a single theme, premise or brief interlocking event. Sometimes there is a theme or a play such as New York stories or Toronto stories, even Parija theme or sometimes there is a person or a thing um, for, such as coffee and cigarettes. 
that is presented in each story and serves to bind them together. In general terms, it takes the form of self-conscious, self-reflexive and self-contradictory statement. So, this is what we are talking about that how postmodernist anthology films can become. In recent times, directors such as Wong Kar Wai and even Steven Soderbergh, they have come uh, together to make films such as Eros, to uh, Rome with Love and also which uh, to Rome with Love is a Woody Allen movie which is an ode to Rome with a touch of magic realism and where several stories are intertwined. Now coming to Parija Tem, it is a 2006 film, it is a very popular film with 18 short films by 21 celebrated directors from around the world including Oliver Asayas, Gorinder Chadda, Joel and Ethan Cohen, Wes Craven, Alfonso Cuaron and Alexander Payne. Here is a short from Parija Tem. Okay. So, this is what I wanted to introduce you to uh, a movie that questions identities, it questions spaces and also it uh, questions uh, the very fact that you know it is very self conscious, it is very self reflexive, it draws attention to uh, the process of making films. So, this is what postmodernist cinema is all about. So, um, I would like to end here today's lecture at this point, but um, I would suggest that you refer to Pulp Fiction and see how Pulp Fiction and also a film such as Network and The Truman Show, how they resort to um, using all these characteristics and features and uh, how they fall in the category of great contemporary postmodernist cinema. So, thank you very much. <laughs>